welcome to the market assessment part on the maritime business game business plan. So the key question here is, what would you do with 5 million? Well, of course, the first things that pumped into your mind would be to buy a boat. Well, maybe not this luxury yacht, because if you spend 5 million on this, you'll soon be down 5 million because of maintenance, operational costs, and all those kind of things. And there's no income against it. So may I suggest that you consider sometimes something more like the right side picture, a bulk area which you can use to earn money. But basically, how do you select what kind of bulk area to, go to buy and where to operate it, how to operate it? So, the objective of this presentation is how to identify a suitable opportunity to invest in. And to do this, the expected prior knowledge would be that you know what ship types there are and what their rough dimensions are, have some idea of the maritime vocabulary and some idea of the general maritime geography. As for the content of this presentation, the first part will discuss what do you risk, the second part will be identifying your options, and the last part will be how to compare these options. So what do you risk? Well, maybe you're all familiar with the, with the risk assessments that are done. In this case, you look at the risk and you look at the result of the risk or the impact of the risk occurs, and this is called impact. In this case, if you're looking at an investment or an opportunity, you're not looking at the downside but you're looking at the upside so the downside will be if the risk occurs that you are not successful then you will be left with no money so that is zero the upside is then of course the utility so what if the risk doesn't occur and what are your benefits this is called utility and is the average outcome of the investment you make so in a formula with utility is usually presented as one minus p times the benefits that you get from research in, uh, in economics, there used to be an idea of rational economics. So that means that if the utility is equal to the cost of the option, that you will take this option or uh, that it will not take the option because it's, it's equal. But at least when the utility is higher than the cost of the option, you will always take the option. However, further research in recent years has learned out that this is not the case. Let me explain this by the following example. In these four cases, the utility in all cases is 10 euros. However, it was found that a lot more people are willing to pay 10 euros with a very full sense to win 1 million. If you would ask those same people to pay 10 euros to do a match prediction where the two teams are equal and you don't, so you don't know if they will win, lose or tie in the, in the, in the match, then there's a 33% 33, 33 chance that you have it right. So if you bet 10 euros, you might win 33 euros, uh, 30 euros. So th this, is, this is an option where a lot less people will be willing to do it. Similarly to a coin flip, if you pay 10 euros to win 20, chances of a coin flip getting it right is 50%. Uh, if you have it wrong, you lose the 10 euros. There's not a lot of people willing to bet 10 euros on a coin flip. However, if we then go to the lower values where we see that if you if you're willing to loan 10 euros to somebody to basically gain a very small amount with a higher chance of security, then more and more people are again interested in doing this. So there, there's psychologically, even though the utility is the same in all these cases, psychologically, we are dealing with it differently. On top of this, if we take the coin flip, for example, also the actual amount that we may lose has an impact on our willingness to, uh, to do a certain bet or a certain risk, to take a certain risk. For example, if I would ask you to do the, uh, if you would say, well, I would be willing to do the conflict for 10 euros and win 20, then you probably will not be willing to do it anymore when I ask you to do 100 and win 200 euros. On the other hand, more people uh, are likely to take a coin flip if it's only is for one euro and you win two euros. So even uh, the, the amount that we invest compared to the amount that we own, also matters in our willingness to take a certain chance. So keep this in mind, there is no right and wrong, but do discuss, do discuss among, among yourselves when you are, are discussing your business, what kind of risks you are willing to take. Of course, not related to these random chances, but at least related to the business. 
Uh, and, and in this case, what determines your utility? Well, the first thing is the investment cost. As I said, you will be given five million. Some of you might not only be willing to spend half of that, so two and a half to three million. Others are willing to take a loan and go the full way and spend maybe nine or 10 million on the vessel or even more. So uh, it discusses how, well, how much of an investment you're willing to risk for the five million and how far you're willing to go. Of course, also uh, have a, keep an eye on the cost per year. What kind of cost per year do you want? And do you want to have a reserve for that or not? Uh, potential returns yeah, and, and the potential returns are, are basically related to the availability of suitable cargoes. So what kind of cargoes can your vessel carry? Where, uh, where are they uh, located? What kind of requirements are the ports where they are located having towards your ships? And of course, also what kind of frequency does it All these kinds of things will influence your, your, the risk you take with a certain vessel and also uh, impact the risk you are willing to take, or at least discuss the risk you are willing to take in these perspectives. And finally, do not forget to also take a look at the potential competition. So having discussed these risks amongst yourself, then how do you find with knowing what kind of risks you're, you're comfortable with, how do you then identify what kind of opportunities there are out there? So uh, this is a map from uh, showing the shipping in, in 2009 or 2010, it's a bit older already, uh, but it shows all the shipping movements across the globe. Uh, by specific type of ships. And so you can see that, for example, in North America, there's a very busy area. The Mediterranean and the Western Europe are also very busy. Not so busy is, for example, the Baltic Sea. So there's, there's a completely different trade pattern there. There might be less cargo, but because you need an ice class there, there might also be less ships available for that. So there might be a niche market there. And, and so the same goes for Asia. You see a lot of traffic going there from Asia to Europe. But it doesn't say, of course, here if it's loaded or unloaded. So best thing to do first is to take a look at the contracts and, and, and at, the, at the flows of, of uh, imports and exports to identify where there are balance flows or imbalance flows. So in this example, uh, I've, I've taken a liking to, uh, to the, the more busy regions and I've selected five of them, North America, Western Europe, the Baltic, the Mediterranean and Asia. And what I've done here is I've basically counted the number of times there's a contract from that area to one of the other areas. And of course, there's also contracts going within an area, so the diagonal here is not empty. What you should notice here is that there's actually quite some internal traffic for North America and Western Europe. And also that, for example, going away from Asia, there's a lot of contracts. But going back to Asia, there's not that many contracts. So that means there's quite a large imbalance in the trade if you go from Asia to the other side. So if you start in Asia, you have good chances of getting a contract, but getting a contract back to Asia might be a little bit more difficult and you might have to seal empty. So these are kind of things to take into account and also to take into account in your calculations later on. Besides the number of contracts, I would also be interested to see what kind of vessel I need. So in this overview, I've taken a example and put some example values in of what like an average contract would be on a certain route. And what you notice here is that North America is, is slightly larger contracts. Asia has even larger contracts even going and back for going there and coming back from that. And the Mediterranean and the, the, the Western Europe and the Baltic take a lot smaller contracts. So this is also some insight. Of course, it doesn't tell me everything. So what I do next is, well, I've, I've taken an interest in North America and I will study those contracts, but perhaps also the contracts in the other areas a bit more in detail. And I can use many different graphs for it. Uh, I, I can take distribution graphs. I can take uh, box and whiskers diagrams to get an idea. I can take pie charts. I can just study the data as numbers and percentages. Um, so th there's a lot of options here for you to use. And these are just examples. And they're, they're not uh, relevant to the data that I did. But they are options to identify, OK, what kind of contracts are here? How are they divided? Um, and, and what kind of vessel might make sense? And, and what kind of special requirements are there for ports? All those kind of things. So investigate this clearly to get an idea of, of what is happening. So in my case, I, I've liked North America, as I said. So I want to focus on the internal trade in North America. So I went to the consultant and I bought an overview of both the volume as well as the cargo rates. And here you see that in the blue squares and the, and the dotted lines, 
that the volume is actually quite stable over the years. So there's no growth, which is, well, not excellent news, but it's also not bad news. There's also no decline in trade. So I, I have a stable market and also the prices do seem to vary to some extent, but that's all within a margin of about five to 10%. So I'm, I'm going to be happy with the prices being stable and, and being stable for a long term. So it seems to be a stable area where I could, where I could invest in. And well, let's investigate further. So as a summary of, of the demand side that I've taken here, the average contract is 50K. There's 20 contracts available in a year's time. The maximum contract I found out was 85K. The minimum contract was 25K. The max floor strength was quite low. It goes up to 20, but in this case, I only needed 10. The lowest density was quite low, actually, so 0 0.667. And a lot of the, and the low floor strength, of course, also indicates that it's mostly light cargoes that I'm dealing with. So it, it makes sense to invest to invest in something with a low density, that can handle a lot of low density cargoes. There's no ice class requirements, no crane requirements, and I do have to deal with the Panama Canal limits, although the majority of the cargo will be sailing up and down on the East Coast. So, okay, having considered this, then what are my options? Well, this was only the demand side for transport. So have a look, let's have a look at the supply side. So basically I set a price that I want to pay maximum, I've identified the vessels that are related in there and that are available on the market to buy. Then I took an extra set of requirements looking into the density of the cargo hold and I want to have a low density. So we have a, I want to have a high volume cargo hold, which is usually means that I have a lower force strength. And so the, this table displays the number of ships available in each size category and also the number of ships available within that within that number that have a low density, so that are most interesting for the trade that I identified on the left side. Um, given the fact that it's usually not a good idea to take a ship and, and have it be larger than about half the capacity, I've set a first limit that, okay, I need to have a ship of about 25K so I can take the smallest cargo at least. And I should not have a ship over 170K that way because then I'm not even half full when I'm gonna trade. So I have, I, this, this is my first selection of ships. This is quite a broad selection, but then considering the, the ranges that are given there and, and the fact that, uh, that, that it is more or less smaller, I want to have my ships as full as possible. I don't want to aim on the small side because quite some contracts that I found out in distribution are not that small, but they're actually closer to the 50. So that all makes sense for me then to go for this range. So the ships of 50 to 75 uh, Ks and the ship of 75 K to 100 K. Well, if I study these vessels, then the two, uh, the thing I notice on the transfer supply is that there's five suitable options. If I take a look at what their trip durations are for these kind of trips that I'm looking into, that's an average of six weeks, which means that for the first ship type, there could be five ships times eight contracts a year, 40 contracts they could cover. Then the second type of ship is a 75 to 100K. There's only one suitable option. It's a bit faster. It takes only five weeks to complete the duration, but that still means that it can execute 10 contracts. So that means that actually the ships available online and it's also to my competitors, a total of 50 contracts a year could be executed by these ships. There's only 20 available. So there is some risk here of overcapacity and me not being able to get all the contracts that I need. However, if I look at my market assessments earlier, there's a lot more areas where the 50 to 75 K ships are suitable and where they are wanted. So it could very well be that a lot of the other markets are also, this ship is also used for other markets, but I do have to, I do have to be careful with the competition that is available here. So this is the first assessment on like, what is the market? What kind of ships there are? And so basically when you're doing this yourself, study the trade flows, identify what might be a good trade flow, what might be an opportunity, study the future trends of that trade flow and study the vessels that are available for that trade flow. So you have an idea of the competition and I have an idea of the opportunities. But how do you then compare? How do you choose between these options? Well, this is the next step. And basically to compare, you use a SWOT analysis. And SWOT strengths are strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Most of you will probably already have heard of a SWOT analysis. And it means you look at the internal side of your company and you say, well, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, 
And then you look on the market side. On the outside of the company, you say, these are the opportunities in the market and these are the threats in the market. But hold on a second. We don't have a company yet. We have an idea of what we want to do. And we've looked at the external market, but we do not have an idea of what our company will look like. So actually, we are doing the SWOT in reverse. And that's by many called a TOS. So we've now assessed the markets, we identified opportunities, we've identified a threat in the market, and we are now looking for the best combination of strengths and weaknesses to exploit these opportunities and threats. So uh, to put it more, uh, more detail, we first look at the opportunities and threats, and only then are we identifying what kind of vessels we, there are and what kind of company we could be to exploit this. To, get, to continue with the example, the opportunities were that there's a balance complex between ports in North America. There's a link to Europe for the same size cargo. There's a steady trade volume expected. High rates are allowed that I saw so far. And the potential threats are that there's an overcapacity of suitable ships. There was capacity for 50 contracts in the market and there's only 20 contracts available. There's an imbalance in trade with Europe. So it's easy to get from North America to Europe. It's not that easy to get it back to North America. There's a lot less contracts there. So I have to be careful, but it also means that I'm quite isolated and people will not, are not easily jump from Europe to North America. And they're more easily well, uh, tempted to go back to Europe. And finally, because most of the trade is on the East Coast, larger vessels than the, than the Panamax vessels might actually steal some of the trade if they are, are looking to relocate in the uh, Atlantic side. So these are my opportunities and threats that I've identified so far. Maybe if you've seen differently, maybe you see other threats and, and opportunities if you study your data, but they should be based on your study and based on your data. So then if I look at the strength and weaknesses, uh, I, I have my vessels of 50K and 75K, and what are their strengths and weaknesses? So what I've done here, I've taken for each version, I've taken a high and a low, and the high means that I have a high floor strength and the low means I have a low floor strength which was the vessels I was looking for uh, originally. And I've basically set out, okay, what can I do with it? So all the prices are fine. So the, the prices was the first one, uh, the risk I was willing to take on the price. And they all are, com I'm more comfortable with the price and the risk related. So there's no differentiation there. Then the second part is the OPEX, so the operational expenses and the VOYEX. And for the OPEX, of course, it goes that the smaller the vessel, the lower the OPEX. So yes, they are there, they are negative, right? they, they are a risk, they are a weakness, but they are a bigger weakness for the, high, for the larger ship than for the smaller ship. On the other hand, the VOYEX uh, example, I've used all four uh, options because the VOYEX is strongly related to the GT or the gross tonnage of your vessel, which means the volume of your vessel. And if you have a heavy cargo ship, it will have less volume uh, to account for. So also the, the, the cargo holds will be smaller, but it means, and that also means that you have a lower GT value. So the costs of entering a port are a lot lower. So in this case, it means that my VOYEX are the lowest for my high uh, small ship. And then comes my low, low density small ship, which has a larger volume. Then comes the high density uh, ship for the larger size. And then finally the low density ship. So, and of course these, these numbers, this is, this is done now to make it graphical, but these steps might not be exactly identical. And so you should not weigh all these pluses and minus exactly the same weight, uh, just as a reminder for, for the final conclusions later on. And then finally, because of the area I, I focused on, uh, I was focusing on light cargo, which requires a lot of volume. Actually, the, the, the Panamax vessel has, has offered me a better uh, volume to dead weight ratio. So there's actually more volume there and it's closer towards the ideal uh, density. On the other hand, the high uh, density cargoes, they offer a lot less volume and they're basically not very suited because I cannot fill them to their full dead weight capacity. I can only fill them to their volume capacity. Then finally, the light blue area is basically some extra opportunities I identified. So uh, in Europe, for example, I noticed that there's heavy cargo more than light cargo. So if my vessel is able to take some heavy cargo, I might more easily diverge to Europe and, and be successful there. 
So uh, the, 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 high, the high density ships are here as an advantage, the low density ships are at a disadvantage. Also, the dead weight uh, related to Europe is a bit smaller than in America, so the smaller ship has a, has a higher chance in Europe than my Panamax vessel, which is probably too large for the trade in Europe, which I can most easily jump to in the North Americas. And finally, there's a difference of having cranes or no cranes. I did not identify any opportunities for cranes at this point, but it's good to know that these kind of things are there. In your own case, it could also be including ice claws or other measures of the ship that you find important to consider and that are found important in different markets. So don't, not only focus on the market that you are going to invest in, but also focus on the other markets to know what kind of extra opportunities there are for your vessel. So based on this, I finally did select again, the two low density ships of the two sizes, but now I need to compare them. So uh, I've done my strengths and weaknesses and I've compared them relatively. I've known my opportunities and threats. So how do I link the opportunities and threats to the strengths and weaknesses? And how do I then value which of these two options is better? Well, to do that, we use something called the confrontation matrix. And in this slide, you see an example of the confrontation matrix. On the top, you see the opportunities in light blue and the, the threats in dark blue. And on the column side, on the left column side, you see the strengths in green and the weaknesses in red. And these are the weaknesses for the 50 to 75K vessel. If I would put a 75 to 100K vessel here, those weaknesses and strengths might be different, but the opportunities and threats will be the same. Then the next step is to link and identify where the strength and weaknesses interact with your opportunities and threats. And if it is a positive, a highly positive, a negative or a highly negative interaction. So you see that I did that in the table by setting pluses and minuses or two pluses or two minuses for a very much, uh, for, for greater interaction. And this gives me an overview of what my vessel can do and how it can interact with my opportunities and threats. And what you see here is of course that in this key top left area where you combine the strengths with the opportunities, you should have the most pluses. And the most pluses means that your, your option is the most suitable for that particular opportunity and that you're making a right choice. However, never forget the downside. So also take a good look at the weaknesses combined with the threats. Because if you have a lot of minuses offsetting your pluses in the other quadrant, you do know that there will be a high risk that you will need to abandon this market. And that's when you have to look at the other two elements in the, in the table to see how well you're able to take other opportunities and to, to flee over to another market or have another complete, completely different exit strategy for this particular ship and say, well, I will sell the ship and I will reinvest in a completely different market. And this is the, the, the core of what you do. And then in the next presentation, in the next uh, step, you will further dive into this by going into the financial depth of this. But this is a first uh, qualitative assessment of where could you be and, and what could you be doing. So to summarize, how to compare your options is basically identify the opportunities and threats for the demand side, identify the strengths and weaknesses for the ship option or the supply side options that you're going to offer, combine them in a confrontation matrix, and confirm the strategy suitability by looking at the strength opportunity corner, and also elaborate on an exit strategy considering your weakness and threat corner. Thank you for your attention.